Welcome one and all to the High Pressure Podcast. My name is Jeff Beamish, Air Quality Meteorologist at Sonoma Technology in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm Patrick Zahn, the Lead Forecaster at Sonoma Technology. And I'm Steve Irwin, also an Air Quality Meteorologist at Sonoma Technology. Well, gentlemen, spring has sprung at least for some portions of the lower 48. Our apologies to those of you maybe watching, listening from the Great Lakes where winter just won't give up. But spring is certainly in full effect, especially into eastern Kansas. Why eastern Kansas? Because this is the time of year when there is a lot of prescribed burning that's happening in an area known as the Flint Hills. We're gonna focus on the Flint Hills today, talk about their prescribed burning that happens during the spring season, why it benefits that area, and also the air quality impacts that burning has, not only for the Flint Hills region, but for other portions of the Midwest and Great Lakes. Finally, we are going to talk about one of the forecast tools we have here at Sonoma Technology that helps out land managers in the Flint Hills with some of those prescribed burns that occur. First and foremost, though, why do they burn in the Flint Hills this time of year? And for that, I'll hand it off to Patrick. Thanks, Jeff. So for centuries now in the Flint Hills region, every spring they've been conducting agricultural burns to burn off the brush from their grasslands. That helps the grass grow, and it also helps feed the cattle then each spring. So like I said, they've been doing this um, for centuries now. It's part of their land management program. They conduct most of these burns in the months of March and April. And there are a couple of things that land managers need to consider when they're conducting these burns. One is obviously fire danger. They don't want the fires to be uh, carried out of control by high winds, but they also need to consider the air quality impacts. So we're going to be highlighting a couple of cases where burning in the Flint Hills did lead to some pretty dramatic air quality impacts both locally and regionally. And then we're also going to talk about uh, how land managers can reduce those air quality impacts. Yeah, Patrick, what you're taking a look at right now is satellite imagery from Saturday, April 9th, 2022. Notice all these red speckles here in the eastern Kansas and the far northern portion of Oklahoma. This is satellite imagery detecting these prescribed burns that are happening across the Flint Hills. This day, April 9th, 2022, happened to be a particularly active uh, prescribed burn day into the Flint Hills, so much though that I got trending on social media. Dan Goldberg, a professor over at George Washington University, noticed on the Tropomi uh, NO2 satellite imagery that the largest NO2 that was observed by satellite in the United States on April 9th happened to be not in Los Angeles, but over the Flint Hills of Kansas. Now this would be satellite NO2 measurements from the surface into the upper levels of the atmosphere. A couple of days later on April 11th, Aerosol Watch, this is a Twitter account associated with NOAA, they noted very high levels of aerosol optical depth, AOD, something we've talked about in the past here on the High Pressure Podcast. Uh, AOD is basically detecting uh, aerosol content throughout the entire column of the atmosphere. And notice these greens, yellows, and reds right here into eastern Kansas, those are high AOD values that are associated with moderate to thick smoke. How do we know it's smoke? Well, not only from satellite imagery from the aerosol optical depth, but here's the Tropomi NO2 satellite data for April 11th. And once again, very high values of NO2 throughout the entire column of the atmosphere into the eastern Flint Hills. So very active uh, prescribed burning situation uh, in the April 9th and April 11th timeframe in 2022 uh, into the Flint Hills. Uh, this certainly not an anomaly because there are very active days for the Flint Hills when it comes to prescribed burning and that burning can have uh, impacts not only locally in eastern Kansas, but in other places outside of Kansas. For more on that, let's go to Patrick. Jeff, before we dive into that, I wanted to go back to your satellite imagery and just highlight one thing here. That's the one. So I really wanted to emphasize that the air quality impacts are from 
sort of this aggregate impact of a lot of small fires. There aren't just three or four fires. We're talking about hundreds or even thousands of small fires. So it's really this built up impact from these small fires that can produce in aggregate a lot of smoke that can impact downwind communities. So I wanted to highlight another episode. This is from last year at the end of March 2021. And it's a several day episode, but what I wanted to start out with here, this is from Air Now Tech Navigator, is just the fire detections on March 31st. Every red triangle here is a, uh, an individual fire detection. And as I zoom in on Eastern Kansas, you can just see um, the number of fires here. So this was a prime burning day for them, for the land managers. So when they're considering um, fire spread or fire danger, they're looking for periods when the winds aren't too strong. And on these days that I'll show, the winds were maybe 10 miles an hour or so. Um, it was also dry. So it was a good period for them to get this burning done uh, in late March into April. But what I'm gonna show you now is the resulting smoke plume on this day. So you can see already from just from the 31st, from all of these fires, a pretty widespread smoke plume um, that's building up in eastern Kansas, moving off to the east into Missouri, as well as the southeast into Arkansas, as well as Oklahoma. But as I move forward one day, we're, we're going to see even more burning and even more dense smoke. And this smoke is starting to get transported well out of the Flint Hills region. Now we're looking at transport into Nebraska as well as Iowa. And again, hundreds if not thousands of ind individual burns leading to this aggregate effect of smoke buildup throughout the region. I'll continue ahead now into April 2nd. Continued burning continued smoke production, and continued smoke transport into areas even farther away from the Flint Hills. So these impacts can be felt hundreds, even a thousand miles away. But lastly, I'm going to end here on April 3rd. And I'm not just going to show the fire detections and the smoke plumes. Let's give the fire detections a second to load. But now I'm going to bring on the 24-hour PM 2.5 concentrations throughout the region. All right, now that they've loaded, you can see that there's widespread yellows here. So, and these are in concentrations, but the yellows indicate moderate, even high moderate uh, AQI levels. And I go forward one more day here into the fourth smoke transport up to the north and off to the east. And on this day, you can see some oranges here. There were actually exceedances of the NACs. That means AQI levels were over 100 for PM 2.5. You can see concentrations here in the 30s. And if I zoom in a bit uh, in the Milwaukee and Chicago areas, you can see that they had several sites that went into the orange. Now that's for PM 2.5. I'm gonna switch it over to ozone though because smoke doesn't just increase particle levels. It can also enhance ozone formation. And actually, if I go to the eight hour average and show the daily maximum on this day, you can see a number of sites for ozone getting up into the upper 60s parts per billion. So that's approaching the high moderate category for ozone. So just to recap this multi-day episode, there were burns in the Flint Hills region over several days that impacted air quality throughout the region, both PM 2.5 and ozone. And for that reason, um, land managers have to consider not just the fire danger, but also the air quality impacts. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Steve, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the finer scale meteorological uh, conditions that govern the air quality uh, when there's burning and smoke in the Flint Hills. Thank you, Patrick. So what you're talking about in essence uh, is dispersion. We have all these fires that are happening across the Flint Hills and really across the region, you have agricultural burning occurring um, on some of these days. And so the real question is how will the smoke disperse and just how will it spread out? Will it 
stay close to the ground? Will it um, go vertical into the atmosphere and disperse in places where people aren't breathing? So dispersion is a really big deal. And so um, we can look at a comparison of two different days here where the number of fires may have been pretty similar, but the air quality impacts are different. And so what I'm showing here first off is an image from April 4th of this year uh, from Air Now Tech, and it's showing the fires just as Patrick was just mentioning. Um, but if I go ahead and remove that layer, we can also see again the air quality impacts. Uh, this is on fine particles on this day of April 4th. So we saw all those fires out there, um, but air quality is not that bad across Kansas. We can see um, PM 2.5 levels are basically low moderate in Topeka, um, low moderate in Wichita, and even there is some good air quality from Kansas City up into southern and eastern Nebraska. And so even with all that fire, dispersion was such on this day that air quality impacts were not that bad. Um, we can compare a very similar day, the, the day that Jeff was talking about, April 9th of this year, Again, a very large number of fires all across the Flint Hills and going ahead and removing that fire layer. This time we do have more impacts in Topeka where it's more mid-moderate. We have some impacts in Southern Nebraska getting up more toward high moderate um, and even down into Oklahoma here, some high moderate PM 2.5 levels. And so with similar fires, we're getting different results and that's because of dispersion. So the couple things that go into dispersion, of course, our number one wind speed. Um, if you have lighter winds, which is what we saw here on the fourth, there were lighter easterly winds occurring and light winds allow the smoke to be dispersed more vertically in nature. So the smoke can go straight up into the atmosphere and not necessarily mix down to where people are breathing. Um, and also the wind direction was key because we had easterly winds on this day. And so if we have easterly winds blowing across this area where most of the fires were occurring, that smoke is being carried for the most part into areas that are not as populated um, across central Kansas here. And it's not coming into places like Kansas City or to Wichita. Um, so the light easterly winds tends to be a better scenario for air quality. Um, for much of the Flint Hills compared to some other directions. Um, southerly winds tend to be one of the worst directions, either uh, south-southeasterly, which is what it was on this day on April 9th. We had stronger south-southeasterly winds, 10 to 20 miles per hour. I think there were some gusts even up around 30 miles an hour on this day. Um, and what that wind can do, it, it may disperse the smoke near the fire so that there's not as much smoke uh, right by where the fire is happening, but it carries it a long distance. And so we have smoke from fires down here in the central Flint Hills and eastern Flint Hills coming up into Topeka and also into southern Nebraska. Um, and those strong winds also can help mix the smoke and keep it down toward the surface. It doesn't allow those plumes to stay as vertical. It really spreads out the smoke at the surface. So you see a wider area of impact in air quality from that smoke. And so dispersion is a big deal. As I mentioned, it, it's hard to quantify because there are so many variables involved, both uh, wind speed and then also vertical dispersion. How stable is the atmosphere? Can the smoke move up or will it be trapped at the surface underneath an inversion? So in order to help land managers in the Flint Hills area know how prescribed burns could impact air quality, especially in the surrounding cities around the Flint Hills. Sonoma Tech developed the Kansas Fire website. The site depicts the potential air quality impacts for prescribed burns in each county across the Flint Hills region from Eastern Kansas all the way down into Northeastern Oklahoma. And it's focused on showing air quality impacts in the larger cities around the Flint Hills. So I'll go ahead and pull up the website here and going again, back to this April 9th case. And just to get into the color coding real quick, so the red counties would be considered as potential for large contributions to air quality. And really, um, that's a flag for land managers to consider postponing prescribed burns that day. Yellow would be a medium contribution. 
um, to air quality. And then green would be a small contribution where you wouldn't have as much impact if you were uh, conducting burns in those green counties on this day. So with more on the modeling behind this site, I will hand it over to Jeff. And before we get to that, if you can go ahead and keep that screen up, Steve, Patrick, I believe, has a question or something to add along to what you were discussing. Right. So I just wanted to emphasize that this is part of uh, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment's smoke management plan, where they're trying to help land managers decide when they should burn. And this is just based on air quality impacts. And the assumption basically is that land managers are going to burn the brush from their grassland at some point in the spring but there are some days that are better than others in terms of air quality and especially in terms of the transport into highly populated downwind areas so the idea behind this model is that it takes a, a hypothetical burn and um, can calculate what the potential impacts are in major metropolitan areas surrounding the Flint Hills. So what this site is providing is decision support and compliance with these recommendations is not mandatory, it's voluntary. And they're really just trying to inform land managers to help reduce smoke impacts. And now I'm going to hand it off to Jeff, who's going to show you a more specific example of how a land manager would use this site. Yeah, so I get to put on my land manager hat for this one here. Let's say that it's April 8th. I'm planning on a prescribed burn on April 9th. And I'd like to see what the impacts would be from a potential fire from my location. Let's say that my location is right here. Osage, the northern portion of Osage County in Kansas. And I see right here that perhaps smoke from a potential fire would have a large impact, a large contribution on air quality for one of the major metropolitan areas around the Flint Hills, be it Topeka, Kansas City, Lincoln, Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska, or down here in Wichita. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of what a potential fire and what the smoke plume from a, from a potential fire, where that would go. So what we can do with this uh, forecasting tool that we have here for the land managers in the Kansas Flint Hills is a page called Your Fire Impacts. That's where we can decide, okay, is my fire going to include a light amount of fuel, a medium amount of, fu of fuel, or a large amount of fuel? Not only the fuel load, but the size of the fire that I'm planning on having. So let's say that I am burning a lot of fuel and it's going to be a very large fire over 5,000 acres. I'd click the view your fire impacts. It would load up. Here's our location again, just for reference, the Northern portion of Osage County in Kansas. And watch what happens with this smoke plume here. It heads off to the North Northwest. And not only are we seeing potential smoke impacts into Topeka, but my plume, from my potential fire could be even impacting Lincoln, Nebraska. And this would be during the evening hours. So this is the kind of detail that land managers can glean from this Your Fire Impacts portion of the Kansas Fire website. Being able to choose the fuel load, the size of their fire and their location, and to plot out the potential dispersion of smoke from a possible fire. Patrick. Yeah, Jeff, if you can go back to the cumulative fire impacts page. So I just wanted to highlight at the bottom of this page, too, that there is a forecast discussion that Sonoma Technology meteorolo meteorologists provide. Um, and that gives some detail into the meteorological conditions um, contributing to smoke transport or accumulation in the Flint Hills. And it, it can call out um, certain portions of the Flint Hills uh, where potential fires would lead to smoke impacts in certain metropolitan areas. So it just gives a little bit more detail in addition to the model graphics. And it's important to point out too that for Sonoma Technology forecasters, myself, Patrick, Steve, what we're forecasting is the potential contribution of air quality impacts from a select site. We're not actually forecasting AQI values uh, through this website. Rather, 
how much smoke from a select site may impact a metropolitan area. So let's take a look at another example of how this website works. Let's say that I'm planning on a prescribed burn on April 10th of 2022, and I live right here in uh, Marion County. So we would again go to the Your Fire Impacts page. And let's say once again, my fuel load is going to be heavy and my fire size is going to be rather large, 5,000 acres, and we'll choose Marion County. We'll view the fire impacts. We'll see why my county, Marion County right here, is flagged red. You'll see here through the morning and early afternoon hours, northwesterly winds are pushing smoke into the central Flint Hills. But as we get into the evening hours, those winds shift more to northeasterly. So all that smoke from Marion County that ended up in the central Flint Hills recirculates during the evening hours potentially and impacts the Wichita metropolitan area. So again, the type of information that you can get uh, from this website for the land managers there in the Flint Hills, invaluable. So if I'm a land manager planning this fire on April 10th in Marion County, and I look at this dispersion model and I see my county flag red, I'd probably be planning on doing that burn another day. Yeah, so hopefully land managers find this model useful and hopefully it has a, a beneficial impact on air quality in the Flint Hills region and uh, even farther away from the Flint Hills. And I just wanted to highlight again that this uh, the model development uh, and maintenance and all of the operations each spring are funded by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And so we thank them for that opportunity and again, hopefully this has a, a positive impact on air quality in the region. And we should also give a huge shout out to the Sonoma Tech modeling team uh, who helped put this smoke dispersion model together uh, for the Kansas Flint Hills region. Um, tireless effort. They've been doing this for years and years, uh, and we certainly appreciate their efforts uh, on this ongoing project as we watch in March and April every year uh, the prescribed burning that happens into the eastern portion of Kansas. Well, that does it for the High Pressure Podcast. If you'd like to check out the Kansas Smoke Dispersion Model, you can head on over to ksfire.org. There is a thumbnail image that allows you to click to access the smoke model that we have put together here at Sonoma Technology. If you'd like to see some of the amazing work that we do here at Sonoma Tech, including that wonderful smoke dispersion model, you can head on over to www.sonomatech.com. As always, follow the High Pressure Podcast on Twitter. We are at High Pressure Pod. I'm Jeff Beamish. I'm Patrick Zahn. And I'm Steve Irwin. Thanks for watching and listening to the High Pressure Podcast.